So too much iron can affect affects people in different ways. No two people get affected the same way. There's a lot of variability in the way it affects people. So, for example, if you're a male and you have too much iron from hereditary hemochromatosis, there's about a 40, perhaps 50% chance if you did nothing over a lifetime, it would cause some problem. If you're a female, it's probably more like 10 to 20%. So not everybody who has the inherited genetic predisposition is going to come to an adverse health outcome. But it's very difficult to predict who will and who won't, and therefore the safest thing to do is to pick people up, diagnose them, treat them, prevent the problem. So the commonest symptoms that we see, again, are lethargy, fatigue and aches. And if you as a doctor suspect someone for whatever reason might have hemochromatosis, the two basic sorts of tests that we would do is to, one, if they're of the right background, and hereditary hemochromatosis is a Northern European, Northern European Celt origin disease. So if you're of Northern European stock originally, be it one, two, ten generations ago, then looking for the genes as a cause for potential iron overload is one thing we can do, and checking the serum iron levels to see if you do have iron overload or not. So both those things are usually done and the simplest way to do them is to do them at the same time and then you answer the question very quickly. Some people will say I'll check the iron levels and then if they're elevated I'll do the gene test but if you're trying to get to the answer quickest it's best to do them both at the same time. If you're asking the question could this person have hereditary hemochromatosis, if the person's not of northern European origin the value of the gene test declines uh, such that by the time you hit southern Europe only about 60% of people who've truly got iron overload actually have the HFE or hereditary hemochromatosis gene mutations that we commonly attribute to the disorder and then by the time you're in Southeast Asia or Africa and thinking about iron overload it's rare to unheard of to have those genes so you've really got to put it in the context of the patient that you're seeing at the time but all people with iron overload are going to have elevated iron studies of some description. So on the pancreas itself, the pancreas used to be thought to be a main site of injury, but it's actually less so now. So from the pancreas viewpoint, and we know this from research, if you look at patients with impaired pancreatic function, so diabetics is the common one, and screen them for hemochromatosis, the gene prevalence in those patients is no different to the general population. So anyone who develops liver disease is at risk of pancreatic malfunction. So what we would generally say is if you've got liver disease, you always assess for pancreatic dysfunction. If you're diabetic, hemochromatosis can present with liver disease and diabetes, so you should assess whether hemochromatosis is there. But more importantly, if you've got liver disease, don't forget to check for diabetes. Um, so they often travel as a pack together, but one's no more important an effect than the other. And the liver disease historically has always been the main port of call for iron-induced injury in humans, if you're talking about the two organs, pancreas and liver. So patients with iron overload can develop diabetes. The pancreas is a very late sort of manifestation of it. And so if you said how many people have I ever diagnosed with hemochromatosis because of a pure pancreatic problem, rare to negligible. Most people I'm seeing who happen to have diabetes and hemochromatosis, it's because either A, they've got liver disease that has contributed to it, B, they've got hemochromatosis, drink too much, or the, one of the commonest reasons now is they're overweight and have hemochromatosis. So the average BMI of someone with hemochromatosis in Australia today is about 28, 29. They're all overweight. Essentially 70% of them are overweight. And it's overweight and obesity that's causing most of the diabetes and glucose metabolism problems in our society now. So it's going to get even harder to attribute to hemochromatosis because it's all weight related. Symptoms generally don't become apparent till adult life, but it's highly variable. Some people can present for the first time with fatigue and lethargy in their 20s, for example. Uh, most people, it's a bit later that they tend to turn up at the doctors with a diagnosis and the symptoms, so 30, 40, 50, and some people even later. So it's highly variable as to when it presents, and that makes it difficult 
on a face-to-face -face discussion to work out who's got it and who hasn't. And that's why a lot of what's been done in the research field has been designed to give people tools that are simple tools that could help them help clinicians identify people who've got the disorder before they actually begin to feel unwell because of it. It's the same as the incidence of diabetes type 2 in the general population. So, and it's common. So if you look at diabetes, it's a very common disorder in our community. So if you've got hemochromatosis and diabetes, the diabetes is managed exactly the same way as diabetes anywhere else, excepting for the hemochromatosis patient is going to have their specific treatment for the iron overload. I primarily become a blood donor to reduce the iron and sometimes the removal of the iron will actually improve the diabetes situation. Not all the time, but sometimes. So iron, if, there's, uh, if it exceeds certain thresholds in the body, can cause injury. So once you've got about more than three or four times what your body should normally have, there's the earliest signs of the liver becoming a bit inflamed and injured. Once you get to more than five times the level of iron that your body should have, that's when we start to get into the threshold for starting to get some scarring going on in the liver and the potential, if it's untreated thereafter, to go on and develop cirrhosis. And the reason we don't want that to happen is even if we diagnose you and even if we treat you, once you've developed cirrhosis, the main risk that threatens your existence is the development of liver cancer and that risk doesn't go away if we treat you after you've developed cirrhosis. And that's why all the emphasis is on finding people early, treating them, because we'd rather prevent 100 people getting cirrhotic than find one who is, and then have them have to be managed and run the risks of liver cancer thereafter. So that's why early diagnosis is really important. So it depends on how quickly you get that iron in you. So if you don't absorb much iron, if you're one of the... 60%, let's say, of uh, men or 80% of women who don't absorb much iron, then it will never get affected. However, if you're one of the people that absorbs iron very quickly, and that can be determined not only genetically but by certain environmental exposures, then you might develop liver disease a lot faster. So there's no one rule fits all. It's all very much tailored to individual patients, if you like the, the buzzword these days is personalised medicine. So we profile everybody and tailor their investigation and treatment to suit what they need. So this recipe of doing everything for everybody the same way really doesn't apply as much as it used to in the past now.